What is Quadrinal and Quadrinal is actually it is an open invitation to the entire art uh, scene in Sweden to get together and voice our concerns through our arts, but our concerns around the political threats that arts are facing today in Sweden. Uh, so this is the last day of Rhetoric Cabinet. Uh, we were so fortunate to be hosted by Fairfabrik in here. Uh, with a big thank you to Fairfabrik. Hi, uh, you can. Uh, for, for hosting us here in our temporary headquarters. Uh, we had quite a few events. We have Simon, he did a great performance here yesterday. Uh, and so today we're going to end our stay here with this talk, The Art of Political Discourse and the Political Discourse of Art. And the real title is, is, is Jimmy Wright. Uh, Jimmy, of course, referring to Jimmy Okerson, who's the party leader of the Serie Demokratina. And we know that he's on the right hand side of the political spectrum. But is he also correct in his analysis when he talks to the people? Uh, so we're going to take a look at that. Uh, and this image is actually a very nice image that I found from here in Sweden. This is 1967, when Sweden decided to go from the left to the right in traffic. Uh, and it, you did it on one day, just like that. So that took years of, or a long time of preparation, maybe not years, but a long time of preparation, but you did it like that. So it's the metaphor that when an election brings a country to a radical political shift, that radical political shift is also going to happen just like that. Uh, and it takes years of preparation as well. So. Why am I going to talk about this as a visual artist? Well, I also have a brood job, uh, and in my brood job, I do semiotic consultancy. So I look a lot at discourse analysis, context analysis, and that's what I do uh, to earn uh, a living. So we're gonna, I'm gonna mix a bit of that brood job uh, experience with the fact that I'm a visual artist, and we're gonna start here. This is 2019, uh, and for those that don't recognize the charming man or the interview, uh, this was the context. Uh, so, as an example, this uh, is as Menskunst. And the issue was, in 2019, uh, Sölvesborg in the south of Sweden decided no longer to buy any more art with the 1% rule, nor would they accept any more utmalende Kunst in public space. And this charming man was uh, interviewed uh, on national television, uh, and he re represented the municipal uh, government there that made that decision. And he states, uh, you can probably read this better than me, but he states the, the big majority of the people don't want to have men's Kunst uh, in their dining spaces. To which the journalist asks, but how do you know that? Uh, and then he says, yeah, okay, uh, good luck to those that want, but I don't want it. And that's the point in terms of discourse analysis. He says, I do not want it. And what that does within a political context is that you put personal taste of the few in front of the taste of the many. And that's something that we're going to see repeated in a couple of uh, excerpts uh, today. So when that happened, uh, immediately after uh, Jimmy Orkerson, who is still the party leader of Sweden Demokratina, needed to come and save the day. And he did a, a big interview at Expressen. Now, Jimmy is a great politician. And he knows his, his job as a politician. And you can see that in the interview because in essence, what he did there is he gave the public and also everybody in his own party a masterclass in the basics of marketing or propaganda, but also in behavioral science. And we're going to go and look at that. And the first thing that Jimmy uh, teaches us as an example is if you want to change a message, a perception, a behavior, a thinking, there's only one thing you really need to do, and that's this. You need to repeat the message. Repeat the message. Repeat the message. Repeat the message. Now, this repetition, that is not a populist tactic. It's a behavioral one. 
And it's important to state that within our context of art uh, and also in other contexts because I often hear people say, okay, uh, we have populist thinking and we are against that, but you cannot counter them with the same tactics because the tactic is thought of as belonging to a political spectrum, which is not the case. This is behavioral science. This is how we communicate. This is how we create habits as human beings. And we know that from uh, the research that's been done in advertising. If you want uh, a message to stick, you need at least three repetitions. Preferably three to seven repetitions of message before people are going to remember the message. So that has nothing to do with the political spectrum you're working on. It's something that's needed from a human perspective. And we can also see that we've seen that in, in history all over. This is uh, the civil movements, uh, civil rights movements in America. This is the 68. You see a lot of repetition of message there. And that was not one day. That was months and years and they're still fighting that fight. They're still repeating the message because it hasn't registered yet. We're not on the scale that's needed. So, so it's not about where you are in the politics to do this. We also see it in art. This is Santiago Sierra. No, the global tour. He, he made this nice uh, big sculpture and he took it around the world reputation of message and it starts to stick. So, a very short clip, and I did the manipulation here, but I just wanted to get that in your uh, heads to uh, watch the longer clip in a second. So I did that on purpose, the three repetitions there. But uh, the question is, he's talking about Kulturpolitismo, the cultural policy goals that are set in Sweden in 2009 in Parliament. Now, I don't know if everybody knows the Kulturpolitismo by heart, but it says this. Uh, culture should be dynamic, challenging and free, based on the freedom of expression. And it should also be used to uh, further develop society. So that is the Kulturpolitismo. There's absolutely nothing wrong with this statement. Now what we just heard Jimmy do is he's changing that message. And he's repeating it and repeating and repeating it. And you'll hear that in the clip. Because in a one minute clip you'll hear that he uses different words. Every time he uses the word that is stated in the Kulturpolitismo, which is Utmanade, he adds another word. A different word and it's either provocative or offensive so what he's doing is he's taking a meaning that's not in the word challenging and he's trying to put that in in the perception of the people and that's that's not only a tactic uh, that you use on just a word uh, we've we saw it immediately repeated after that uh, the year after when he went to the greek turkish border and he said sweden is full we immediately saw repetition coming from the party. So everywhere we saw the same sentence appearing. And that's repetition of message, always the same thing. Repetition of message does not mean that the message is true. This is a, a map of the population density of 27 European countries. So you see that Sweden and Finland over there, as well as Estonia, have a very weird shape because it, they are the least populated countries in Europe. If you compare it to Belgium, where I come from, that doesn't look like that normally. It's a tiny little thing, but it's completely swollen because Belgium has the second highest density in Europe. So when a statement is made that Sweden is full, then the question is full of what? Is it space or people? Because Belgium has 376 inhabitants per square, square kilometer, and Sweden only has 22. Sweden has less people per square kilometer than Estonia. And if you've been to Estonia, Estonia is quite empty. Uh, you go through nature and nature and nature, just like you do here. So repetition of message doesn't make a message true. 
But this is about the kind of discourse that we're hearing from political uh, points of view on art, and that's important for us to understand what is being said here. So we're going to listen to a short clip by Jimmy, and then we're going to talk about other people as well in the political spectrum. Jag tycker att det har funnits en tendens någonstans och det här är väldigt känsliga frågor, vilket för mig är helt ogripligt faktiskt. Därför att det här handlar det om att använda skattepengar. Eh, då, då är frågan, hur ska de användas? Ska de användas till att köpa in eh, till exempel konstföretag som provocerar och väcker anstöt? Eh, eller ska skattepengar användas till att köpa in sånt som kan skapa sammanhållning för rena eh, kommunens ekonomi? Ja, jag väljer ju det senare naturligtvis. Jag tror man ska se det här som ett uttryck för det snarare. Att man istället för att köpa in någon, någon eh, tavla med mänskonst eh, så kan då man kan ha en list av någon tidigare framträdande person från kommunen som alla kan relatera till. Det, då, det är ju en, en skillnad i synen på det här mellan höger och vänster. Det är inte bara i Sverige utan i hela, hela västvärlden. Eh, och där vi ju en enkelt har möjlighet att göra någonting annat än det som det socialistiska styret har gjort i Söderspår i 30 års tid. Borde politiker eller politiken lägga sig i med i vad som är bra eller dålig konst? Nej, det tycker jag inte. Däremot så tycker jag i högsta grad att politiker ska lägga sig i hur man använder skattepengar. Och det är helt olika saker och det är vänstern och framförallt kulturvänstern reagerar alltid oerhört starkt så får man kritisera deras utmanande anstödsväckande konst. Men det är också det som är syftet, så att, att man ska kunna kritisera den. Eh, jag tycker inte att skattepengar ska användas till att spitsa samhället, utan jag tycker att skattepengar ska användas till att hålla ihop samhället. Okej, så en kort klipp från hans långa intervju. Och han lär oss så so mycket om allt han står för, och vad partiet står för, och vilka typer av taktik han ska använda för att få det här messaget across. Now, if we do a very high-level uh, discourse analysis on that and what he says, let's see what, what, what matches, what makes sense. So he says taxpayers, since they are paying for the bill, uh, they should be able to decide. And that's correct. Uh, nothing wrong with that. Now, in our democratic society, that's because they get to vote. And through their vote, uh, they come to a political consensus, and out of that political consensus in terms of art, we got our cultural policy goals here in Sweden. So that's all fine. Now, he also wants to change certain meanings of the Kulturpolitismo, and that is where it goes wrong. So we can say that 90% of his reasoning is clear, it's straightforward, and it's also correct. So, He's right about all this talk. This is the democratic process we are in. But then when he wants to change the meaning of the Kulturpolitismo and put in personal taste there where the taste should represent the many, then we have an issue. So going back to the Kulturpolitismo, what he does first is make sure that Uppmann becomes uh, understood second so offensive in the public eye. And that's what we're dealing with, the public eye on art. And the second one is he doesn't want to develop society, but he wants to keep it together. And that is actually not the idea of, of what the politicians should be doing here. So we see repetition of, oh, sorry. Yeah, so what does that mean? If you want to uh, hold out the hook, keep it together, that's a static vision on society. If you want to develop it, that's a forward moving uh, view on society. The reason is, the reason why we need something challenging is that a challenge creates movement. Uh, and if you're static, you just stop. That kind of thinking about the taxpayers' money, we saw immediately repeated again. Here, uh, close to Stockholm, in Tabi Bibliotek, uh, there was voices from his party, again, that wanted to stop a lecture by an LGBTQ author. And the reason they gave was, when taxpayers uh, pay the bill, everybody uh, should be addressed. And that's not how democracy works. The many is not everybody thinks the same. The many actually means a lot of minorities and all of them are equal. So, but it is a very good thing to take a look at how people think. So, what about the remaining 10%? I mean, if Jimmy was rising on the top, how is that being executed today? And that's the question. 
So the cultural political uh, policy, that is actually, that's taxpayers' money and that's going into society through the public institutions. So are they executing the Kutun politics model? That's the question. And how should they? The question is, should modernalisate should modernize it go on strike if, if the culture politics mall is attacked politically? So if Leif Svenkres, if people ask to ban that uh, art in public domain, should National Museum go on strike? If there's a question for a ban on gangster rap, should the folk musicians go on strike? And that's the question uh, we also need to figure out as an art world. Uh, but it brings us to another uh, discourse that we heard this year. So does Kanad Christoph go to our current cultural minister? Confuse questions that relate to her function as minister of democracy with questions that relate to her function as minister of culture. And we're going to look at a small clip again. Det har pågått en stor debatt om gangsterrappen och hur den är sammankopplad med gängkriminaliteten. Eh, Sverigedemokraterna sa tidigare i höstas att regeringen borde uppmana brottsförebyggande rådet att eh, utreda gangsterrappen på grund av det här. Hur ser ni på det? Alltså det är ju väldigt viktigt att titta på det och säga vad lägger det till. För självklart är det som statsministern säger att det ska hända på varje steg för att komma ihåg problemen som finns i samhället. So this was only her second day on the job, and the next day she apologized as cultural minister, saying that she didn't handle that question correctly, uh, and she's right uh, on the second day. Uh, now, I'm putting this example in also to show the media impact on messages. So we have a, a very fresh Minister of Culture, Sports, also Democracy. And on her second day, she's getting asked this question from a journalist who asked, you as the Minister of Culture, what can you do? And she starts to answer it as the Minister of Culture. And that, for me, is also how media can navigate messages. Because that was the headline. And I just want to ask you guys, don't have to answer now, but just think of it. What if this was the headline? The Minister of Democracy refuses to even consider undemocratic questions. That would have spun that message completely upside down. And the reason I'm stating this is, so the situation was, there was a question political question asking to ban gangster rap on state radio. When that question hits the table of the Minister of Democracy, she could say, if you want to silence a minority out of your society, that is undemocratic, and we are living in a democratic society. So it has nothing to do with the fact that it was gangster rap. It could have been folk rap, uh, folk music, it could have been a Vinci, it doesn't matter what it's the question to ban that was undemocratic. So there was no relevance for her to actually answer it as a cultural minister. It, there's only relevance for her to answer it as the minister of democracy. But it, this is uh, an example on how the media also uh, navigates with messages uh, from their perspective. We got a clip on SVT as well at the end of last year, and we only got it, so it was conditional, if we would also answer the question of the gangster rap. Today with the gangster rap and the ban for the gangster rap is the same issue. And it's a test, it's a test of democracy where somebody gets cornered into a position where they have to stand up for something that's very difficult to defend. And you have to stand up for that because you have to stand up for the free expression of everyone. And if you lose one, you lose everything. It's, it's an all or nothing situation. So that's why it's so important to stand up for the free artistic expression, because it's about the freedom of expression of all the people in Sweden, not just a few.
That brings us to the next uh, question we put out there. Why is Ulf Christensen telling the truth when he tells Volker Kultur's audience that Moderatna is all for the arm's length principle? So I'm not going to show you the clip, but I went to the online convent conference of Volker Kultur. All the, not all, most of the political parties were represented, and they had short clips where they could state their position in terms of uh, what they thought about art and how uh, their policies would uh, connect with art and culture. So Ulf says, uh, comes up and he goes, Moderatma is all for the arm's length principle. And I can guarantee you that he was not lying. And I can guarantee you with an example coming from advertising. This is 1950s America. Uh, all the detergent products, all the washing products in America, all claim that they wash whiter and cleaner than any of the other ones. So there's a big research that's conducted, and all the products are being tested. The result of the research was that all the brands came to the same level of cleanliness and whiteness. So they were all the same. There was no way to differentiate. As soon as that research hits the market, there was one brand, and they come out, and I've forgotten the name, but they come out with the, the, their slogan, no other brand washes whiter than us. And they're absolutely not lying. So they said, no other brand washes whiter than us. So that's just another way to formulate that every brand washes the same. But, by reformulating, you imply something. So if you change the formulation, you actually imply that you wash whitest. But you're not saying that, you're implying that. And that's what happened with uh, Ulf Christensen. And it's this image, you might have seen this, this has been a meme on Facebook. So you have this concept, and the concept in our context is the arm's length principle. Now, we're in the art scene. And we all have a perception of what the arm's length principle means. Ulf is a politician, and he also has a perception of what the arm's length means. But is it the same? And that's the question. Because if Ulf, when he says, Moderatuna is all for the arm's length principle, he actually means we're going to cut off all subsidies to the arts, because then we become non-interventionist politics. And that there is no intervention then he's not lying. But that would mean that the entire public funding of art disappears. But when you're listening to that as an audience with already a perception in your head that you know what the concept is, then you might be thinking like, okay, so he's gonna leave everything as it is. There are going to be subsidies, there are going to be public art institutions, stuff like that, but he's, he never said that. So it's our responsibility to ask him, what do you mean? How do you see that? Which brings us to the next question that we prepared, and that's this. Is Folk Kultur sending mixed signals to its target audience? So Folk Kultur uh, is a huge, to, this year it was a huge online conference, other years it's an in real life conference of all the players in the art field that can come together and create uh, the art field uh, and we're going to go through their vision in a second. When the newsletter uh, was sent out early this year, I cannot tell you how many people forwarded that newsletter to me, saying, Father Noel should be there. And I agreed. Uh, and I, together with Anna Koch from Weld, we tried to contact them, we did contact them, and we said, we're getting so many inputs from people that say you should be there, uh, that, that we're phoning you up and we're asking, can we attend or can we even speak at your uh, platform? And they went, sure. And then they sent us an effect, which is fine. But I had been looking at their website and their vision to understand what Folk Couture really was. And I found this. So it's together we're going to create the, the leading convent or meeting place for art. Uh, surrounding the, the meaning of art in a democracy in terms of uh, societal development. So this really connects with Kulturpolitik Small from earlier, somehow it's uh, Utfekli, uh, and it's going to be uh, democratic, 
uh, we're going to be a catalyst for a free and accessible art and cultural life in the entire country. And that is a great vision. I love that vision. But it's connected to a model. And the model is this. If you want to speak at the convention, you can either be an arrangeur or a content partner, and it will cost you 60,000 krona or 90,000 krona to speak there. And then we have two things. Then we have two messages that when we put, put that together, we're going to work for an accessible arts and cultural life, but you need to pay to speak there, and you also need to pay to attend. Then you have two conflicting models. Actually, you have a vision and a model that wouldn't allow that vision to become true. Because the vision is talking about accessibility, inclusivity. The model is a paying promotion conference model. So the people that have the money to speak there, they get the possibility to develop uh, our society in terms of art. And that's an exclusive model. So inclusive vision, exclusive model. Another thing is that they have the great Aftos policy for people that are going to talk on their uh, platform. And it's, it's mainly about this. Uh, democratic values, uh, equality, uh, it's the European Convention uh, of Human Rights, together with the Swedish Kulturpolitis uh, Mold, the cultural policy goals. Those should be the values that you represent as a speaker. Now, they are talking also about politics, policy, and art. And as I said earlier, all the parties got invited to speak on this platform. Uh, and I asked them this question as well. I haven't received an answer yet. Uh, so all the parties got the invitation, and they should. I believe they should. Every voice should be there if it's really a convention for us to understand what the political view is on art today and everyone should be there. But this, this last one is a difficult one because members of uh, SD have already been officially on record in newspapers and uh, interviews stating that they want to change the culture politics small. So that wouldn't work with their own uh, Aftal's policy. And I asked them these questions, like how do you get around this? Uh, how, how do you get around an inclusive vision with an exclusive model? How do you get around this integrity policy together with parties that you already know don't subscribe to it? And I'm at my third uh, repeat question right now. Uh, so I sent them the mail before the convention started. I sent them a mail again after the convention. Then I got this one February 21st. Then they got another reminder by me and I'm still waiting uh, for a reply. Uh, at some point, I'll, I'll get a reply or not. Um, yes. Going quite quickly, uh, we're at our last but least question. Uh, is elitism an egalitarian necessity? It's a difficult question. Um, I don't know if the answer uh, is that obvious, but it's something that we hear a lot in terms of discourse and perception on art, that art is elitist. We, in the next room, we have an interactive uh, piece that asks the question, why is art essential for society according to you? And somebody, uh, a visitor, also uh, put a, a card next to it saying, is it? Uh, and that was our question. Is it essential? Is it essential for everyone? Uh, and they added, is it really uh, essential? And it should be more inclusive. And it's the last bit that I just want to talk about. Because at some point we always get it within the arts. It's about elite and elitism. And I want to talk uh, elite and elitism with this artist. Uh, I didn't know him when I came here. I don't know if everybody knows him. This is Zlatan Ibrahimovic. He does great solo performances on the green field. Uh, so this is football. I am personally not a football fan or follower, but I, I have nothing against it, I just don't know it. Uh, why am I putting up this in our context? When we get the question or the, the comment that art is elitist, we often get that question from somebody outside of the art field. 
so not, they're not in our context, but they, they work with our context somehow, they get confronted with our context and they ask that question. When we answer that question from our context, not even thinking about the context that is known, it becomes a difficult conversation. Now, elite is something that we have everywhere. We have elite in the arts, we have elite in sports, we have elite in sciences, we have elite everywhere. Uh, so when we can actually say as a comment on the question whether art is elitist, it's about what is being elite. So elite, one perspective is, is the top. It's the top of the pyramid, it's the best of the best. And if you look at sports, then you go Olympic Games, you go uh, World Cups, and then we have Sarah Kirstum uh, with all her medals here. Uh, elite swimmer. But the top of a pyramid means there's also a base. And that's the base here in Sweden. So we have all the sports schools that get a lot of money and funding from society because you need that pyramid to have a top. And we can do the same argument with art. So this is Natalie Juvay. We could consider her an elite international Swedish artist, which is also just on top of a pyramid that is based on all the Kulturskolan in Sweden and all the money that's going in there and the art schools on top of that and the public institutions and they form the base. If you take that base away and there are political voices that just want to take the base away, what happens then is that for a small period of time you will still have your elite and you can use that elite to go international and show that elite but then nobody else is going to come. So you get lost generations because to get on top of the pyramid, that <coughs> takes time. And when I say there are political voices that want to stop that, it's because when I arrived in Sweden in 2018, I actually went and demonstrated that year uh, here in Stockholm because the, the, the Stockholm government had put a budget in front of uh, their, their government that needs to vote to cut uh, culture schools, cut a lot of money. It, that didn't happen. Thankfully for Sweden, it didn't happen because we know what the results are long term. And that's a first perspective on what elite is and elitism. The second perspective is this one. So we have uh, Jan van Eyck uh, in, in Ghent, Belgium, and we have Ryan Gander there in Documenta 2012. Going from Jan van Eyck to Ryan Gander, that actually means there's a learning curve. There's a learning curve that creates appreciation in art. And I can actually say I am an elitist, and I think everyone here is an elitist. But it is another kind of elitism that the, the comment that we get from pol politics is. It's an advanced learning curve. When we start in art, and it doesn't matter what field, when we start in sports, when we start in science, it's always the same. We need to learn. And as we learn, our appreciation changes. So if you've gone through art history, and you've gone through, through the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, Baroque, and all the moderns, and then you end up in contemporary art and documenta, you're there with a different kind of appreciation than when you just started and you're still here. If you're with your appreciation at Van Eyck, and then you were confronted with Ryan Gander, then you will say, but this is inaccessible. And you're right, but it's inaccessible because it's not the level that you're at at that moment. It might become accessible when you grow in your learning curve. So that's the second thing on uh, elite. And the third uh, point here is, but that is it, uh, all the, State museums are free. You don't have to pay anything. And those three things together is how you create an elite in any human field. So it's not just art, it's not science, it's not just uh, sports, it's in any field. You need a top of a pyramid, and that implies that you have a base. You need advanced learning curves. People go and learn and become the best. And you need the broadest possible inclusivity to get that broadest possible base. Somebody once told me that if you want to look at a country in terms of how they're doing, in terms of real welfare for the people, look at uh, the, the medal count of the Paralympic Games. Not the Olympic Games, but the Paralympic Games. 
Because the countries that really score high in the Paralympic Games, they are putting a lot of money in a minority group of the entire sport field. And if they win gold and bronze and silver, that means that's been going on for a long time. You can have a fluke now and then, but this is actually a good way to measure welfare. And if you're attentive, and I think you all are, you also see, of course, Russia and America there. They have different takes on society, but they also put a lot of money in their uh, sports, and that's for another reason. That's really more the reason of we want to show that we are the best, uh, no matter what uh, our country is at at that moment. But if you look at Sweden and Norway and Germany, you will see that they become the top because of prolonged policies that reinforce equality in all fields of society. So for those countries, it's a consequence. So a short cartoon, what is elitism? Actually, actually, elitism is when you favor the few over the many, but not based on merit. And that is, again, that connects with what the first visual you favor the few over the many, not on merits, whether the th truth around what cr what's necessary to, to create an elite is you need this. It's a hierarchical structure. It's just the best of, of a lot of people. And we read our last question. Um, is perception important for the Swedish art world during election year? Because that's what we're doing at Kvalinal. We're trying to bring a lot of art to the people during election year. So why are we doing that? And we're doing that to create, to counter the misconception that art is not essential for people. Uh, and an example, it's an anecdote. Uh, this is Belgium, 26th of December, 2021. So only three months ago, you see a lot of mouth moths there. This is full corona crisis, of course. Uh, and this is the demonstration in Brussels on the, the Boxing Day, so the day after Christmas. What happened there? Uh, and why am I using this as an example of the perception of art? So, a week before the Christmas holidays in Belgium, all the politicians got together with all the experts, uh, the, the health experts, around the, the growing numbers, in corona numbers in Belgium. The numbers were going into red again, and they said, we need to do something. Uh, and the experts said, actually, no, we've done everything. Everything is in place. At that moment, the art and cultural life was open in Belgium. It closed down also for a bit. So at that moment, it was open. And uh, it was open with uh, mouth mask, COVID passports, limited seating, and all new installations to purify the air in all the institutions. So a lot of investments had been made. Politicians said, uh, can culture stay open? And the expert said, yes, uh, this is it. This is everything we can do. We just have to write this out. Uh, and politicians decided, no, we have to go into the holidays making a clear statement that we are doing something for the people. So they decided the whole cultural scene closes down tomorrow. Uh, movie theatres, re regular theatres, dance, all shows, everything closed down the next day. And that was the first time that the Belgian art scene responded. Uh, just as here in Sweden, uh, when the cultural life was closed down, they said, okay, this is our part that we need to do for society. And we, we okay, we, we, can, we can see that there might be a valid point or not. Uh, in Belgium, it was easier to defend it because everything got shut down. In Sweden, it was more difficult to defend because here the restaurants stayed open and when the planes started flying, cultural life was still closed. So then it was a more difficult conversation, but there were no demonstrations. So that happens just before the holidays. And the cultural uh, scene in Belgium says, no, we cannot accept this. There's no ground for it. There's no argumentation for it. So we got to demonstrate, and they did. Thousands of people got on trains and in cars and they went to demonstrate, and they also sued the Flemish government for this decision, and they won. They didn't know uh, at that time that they were going to win it, but they still won. Uh, and it set a precedent for all the next policies uh, that were going to come. That the politic politicians had to have expert arguments if they wanted to shut down an industry, because this was the first demonstration against that. Now, 
I'm still, I still haven't told you why I'm showing it to you. It's for the public perception. The day after, there was only positive comments in the media and on the streets about this. So the general perception of people that had nothing to do with art still believed that the art scene and the cultural scene did the right thing. They had to demonstrate, even though it was corona. So they got the general perception on their side. And that was because the general public understood there was a political mistake that had been made, and the entire industry was the victim of that. And when the victim then stands up and says, no more, then you get an underdog situation, and the public says, yes, absolutely, go for it. And that was important. Uh, we're almost at the end. Uh, this is a, actually a Belgian cartoonist as well. Uh, this went around the world because it also made sense. This is something a lot of artists hear uh, during their career. Uh, if you can't make a living uh, from it, maybe you uh, need to consider it a hobby. But here it's reversed. It's a nice detournement, like Guy de Bois would say. Uh, two words, of course, very polluting industry that also cannot survive without any subsidies from the state. Uh, so, two more slides. Yes. Uh, one last thing here, Hong Kong University removes Tiananmen Square Memorial from campus site. All these kind of tactics to control the message, to change the message, it's not part of one or another political spectrum. This is actually the other, this is the left populist spectrum. Um, and the, the monument was taken down just, uh, it was also Christmas time, uh, December 23rd, so also only three months ago, this was the monument. Why did they do it? It's about controlling the message. So for me, when I, when I think about the art world here in Sweden, why I believe uh, the art world should consider taking control of their message is because if we don't control our own message, our own perception, then somebody else is going to. And then somebody else is talking for us. Somebody else is saying to, to their voters what art is. And if we cannot address our own message, what art can be for everyone, then we lose the control of that message. And when we lose that, then, then we don't know what, what's going to happen. Because we've given up. We, we, yeah, we didn't take control. Another last art piece. War is over if you want it. Apparently, we don't want it yet. Uh, we are in full war right now. Uh, but that was my talk for today. So thank you guys very much for uh, listening so very, very attentively. <laughs> Uh, if you have comments or questions, then uh, shoot, we have the space uh, until four uh, and we can talk. But thank you for coming. Thank you.